Very well, welcome to everyone. I am absolutely delighted to open this event organized in collaboration with the Italian Institute of Culture in Dublin to present the 2022 season of the INDA Foundation, Istituto Nazionale del Dramma Antico at the Greek Theatre in Syracuse. It is a pleasure and an honor to have today with us the Managing Director of INDA, Marina Valenzise, the Director of Ifigenia uh, and Tauris, Jacopo Gassman, and its translator, Giorgio Ierano. A very big welcome and a special thanks for giving us this wonderful opportunity to learn more about INDA, the plays which will be staged this year, and in particular uh, Euripides uh, Iphigenia and Tauris, for the third time at the Greek Theatre in, uh, in Syracuse. Uh, as you know, many artists and intellectuals have studied, translated and adapted this tragedy over the centuries. And this already rich group has been reached by the great names who worked on the first two Iphigenia um, in Tauris at the Greek theater back in the 30s and the 80s. Just to name one, one with a Sicilian and Mediter uh, Mediterranean uh, identity, the writer Vincenzo Consolo, for example, who did for Inda a four-ended poetic translation of this uh, and is drama of nostalgia and exile. So I cannot wait to know more about how Jacopo Gassman and Giorgio Ierano have interpreted, translated and staged this myth. Um, I also very much hope that many of you from the audience will have the chance to go to Syracuse between May and July. I can personally testify that attending a classical play at the Greek theater in Syracuse is a um, immersive experience from the moment you enter the archaeological park of the Neapolis and make your own way to the theater because while walking you can really feel how powerful is the bond between Sicily and the Greek culture and let me say that the acme of this feeling is reached while you are uh, sitting on the steps of the theater and the sunset makes the performance and the atmosphere even more uh, breathtaking and we should thank Inda for making this possible every year and I'm glad that uh, Marina Valenzise will tell us more about that. Um, I must stop talking now, I know, sorry for such a long introduction. So before I leave you, I would like to warmly thank Mirko Canevaro Professor of Greek History at the University of Edinburgh, who will chair today's roundtable conversation. And thanks also to our experts from Dublin and Pisa, Helen Mini and Davida Mendola for joining us. So thank you all for your attention. And I will now leave the floor to Marco Gioacchini, director of the Italian East of Culture in Dublin. Thank you and over to you, Marco. Thank you very much, Kian, and a warm welcome from Dublin to this event celebrating the 57th season of the Greek theatre in Syracuse. We are very delighted also for the collaboration with the Italian Institute of Culture in Edinburgh, and uh, we are sincerely uh, thanking them for organizing and you for organizing this uh, fascinating event. So I would like also like to thank the panelists that you already mentioned for the contribute for tonight presenting the cultural uh, program of the forthcoming season at the Teatro Greco di Syracuse. But especially uh, the historical interests in uh, um, academic classics and Greek theatre, especially in Ireland. And especially I would like to introduce a little bit Helen Mini and Dr. David Amendola for that. Helen is a renowned theatre critic and editor for The Guardian, and as well as uh, uh, she is the director of the Festival Classics Now, an ancient uh, story uh, festival newly launched in 2020, but uh, which uh, quickly gained great visibility in bringing art, literature and ideas of the ancient Greeks and Romans to the Irish uh, uh, audience. Dr. Amendola is a former uh, research fellow at the Trinity College, Dublin, who conducted research in classics and ancient history, and now is uh, returned back to uh, Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa. 
So thanks to the presence of those uh, two speakers, we can also contextualize a little bit the um, the Irish interest into uh, the Greeks and the Romans history. So thank you very much for this event and I give the floor to Marina Valencise for uh, uh, presenting the program of tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Giacchini, and thank you uh, to Director of Edinburgh, the Italian Cultural Institute, Chiara Manzato. I'm very pleased and very glad to be here with you uh, since I know how much uh, the, the, the Irish culture and the Scottish culture owe to classics and to classic uh, heritage. And I wish uh, to thank especially Professor Canevaro, Dr. Zamendola from Trinity and now Normale di Pisa, and Dr. Helen Mini of the Classic Now Festival. Let me just introduce you uh, uh, what INDA is. INDA is the National Institute of Ancient Drama, a foundation since 1998, but it started 100 years ago to promote, the mission of INDA is to promote the classical legacy by performing ancient masterpieces of the Greek tragics, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and of the Latin theater in one of the most ancient theaters in Europe, built in the fifth century before Christ and rediscovered and renewed at the beginning of the 20th century, thanks to Paolo Orsi, who was the archeologist superintendent of uh, Syracuse and of Southern Italy, and thanks to the generosity of a group of patrons, all young Sicilian aristocrats and intellectuals who decided to give a new life to the Greek theater on the wavelength of the rebirth of Greek tragedy conceived and staged by Richard Wagner when Bayreuth Festival celebrated the new tragic epic in the name of Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art. So even today, a century later, the INDA, Istituto Nazionale del Dramantico, core business consists in endowing classic tragedy with its dimension of global work of art. The founder's father, the Gargallo brothers, as the exhibition on Orestea Atto Secondo, Orestea Second Part shows, and you can see this exhibition here in Syracuse until September and then in Rome at Palazzo Altens, reinvented the ancient drama dimension precisely to renew the complexity of the work of art. The founder theorized this exit as the only dimension that can revigorate, that can give again vigor, give a new vigor to the modern theater in its popular function as the one defining ancient theater and especially Greek theater. A dimension that renew an art as the ancient drama that was based on the multiplicity of arts and included several other arts, poetry, music, lyrics, curls, design, dance, painting, architecture, choreography, all converging simultaneously in the creation of a miracle such as ancient theater was. This is the reason why Syracuse and Inda in particular nowadays still carries the founding idea that the theater and art are a constant flux and offers a fluid mirroring of the ancient set text, as David Livermore says, the famous director who will stage since May 17, Aeschylus trilogy, or Estia, with Agamemnon, Coifor, the Libation Bearers, and, uh, um, and the, the Humanities. This year, we shall have an important debut with Robert Carson, one of the most talented opera director who will be staging Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. It will be a new experience for him since he only worked in outdoor theaters for opera and never for the stage. Oedipus, he says, is a piece that deal with, deal, uh, with, that deal with the unjustness of being a human, the relation that we have to the cards we are dealt, and what our lives turn to be for which we are responsible and we are not responsible at the same time. 
It will be a very important uh, premiere. Uh, the debut starts on May 18th, and it will uh, have the participation of the students of ADDA. What is ADDA? Is the drama school, the school of drama, Accademia d'Arte dell'Arte Drammatica, ADDA, that belongs to our foundation, to the Instituto Nazionale del Dramantico. 50 uh, students coming from all over Italy will be uh, participating to the show, uh, to, the, to, the, to the stage, will be staging uh, the, uh, the, the show of uh, Oedipus Rex. It will be a very important for us, a very important appointment. And then we have, and I'm very glad to, to introduce you, uh, to introduce him to you, Jacopo Gasman, uh, who is a, a young but very talented director, and he will be staging, as uh, Chiara Avanzato said, the Iphigenia in Tauris, an extraordinary story that goes through the centuries and arrives nowadays, if we only think of what happens in Crimea, the ancient Tauris, that is Ukraine, and that is not longer Ukrainian. The, uh, the, the, the main idea, as I said, is to rediscover, the main idea of Vinda is to rediscover the essence of classic tragedy and uh, to renew with the tradition that belongs to the Renaissance when in Florence at the beginning of the 17th century, the Camerata de Bardi created the melodrama looking for the origins of uh, the Greek uh, tragedy and of the Greek theater. But uh, let me leave the floor to Mar Mirko Canevaro, and, uh, uh, whom, I, whom I warmly thank. And uh, let me just tell you that uh, on our site, on our website, www.indafondazione.org, you will find all the information about the shows, about the tickets, and about all uh, the activities and initiatives that we shall be having in uh, summer, in, this, in the 57th summer. Thank you, and please take the floor, Mirko, it's up to you. Thank you very much, that was a wonderful introduction. I'm also very pleased uh, of, uh, of getting the chance to moderate. In fact, my job is fundamentally to direct traffic tonight. So, uh, but I'm particularly pleased about this meeting because as many classes, I guess, uh, well, I spent some lovely, lovely night at the Greek theater in Syracuse and I'm, I hope I'll be able actually to, to go at some point this season. So that will be wonderful. Um, just one how, housekeeping note, uh, like uh, remark before uh, giving the floor to Jacopo Gasman. Uh, for those that are not among the core panelists, uh, if you want to ask questions, you're very welcome to. Uh, you should use the Q&A chat on the right side of your screen, and I'll uh, make sure after the main interventions to, to, to read out what you've written, okay? So, without further ado, uh, I leave the floor to Jacopo Gassman, who, who, if I understand correctly, is actually speaking from the Greek theater in, in Syracuse. So, thank you very much uh, to you. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, I am indeed speaking from the uh, ancient uh, Greek theater. We are um, in these days working on some uh, technical aspects of uh, of our play, of our tragedy, and uh, it's really obviously such a great honor and emotion. Um, let's talk about uh, Iphigenia and Tauris uh, for a second, and then I think it, it's probably interesting also to uh, to have a dialogue uh, um, with the other panelists. Um, let me say a couple of things about Iphigenia in Tauris. Um, at a first uh, reading of this text, uh, um, um, there are many things that sort of um, come to the attention of the reader. The first thing is probably this uh, this very particular uh, thing about uh, this play, which which is its uh, 
sort of it's stylistically hybrid i would say uh because for the the first part of the play we are in front of a very dark uh i would say almost obscure tragedy somehow we are in this uh no man's uh no man's land um and um uh, the atmosphere is very, is very, yes, it's very dark. Um, the fact is that at a certain point of this play, when uh, the two brothers, uh, brother and sister somehow meet and finally recognize each other, uh, and here there is a, also a great uh, critical debate about it, uh, the tragedy takes another sort of, uh, it takes another path i would say uh, certain critics uh, call it the second half of this uh, of the tragedy they 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 speak about uh, almost an adventure an escape tragedy with a happy ending um i tend to disagree with this reading i believe that the second half of iphigenia in tauris is actually uh, a deeply problematic a deeply philosophical um play and text uh, I believe that there is absolutely no happy ending, although somehow uh, our protagonists manage to leave this island. Um, but going back to uh, the philosophical aspects of this tragedy, let's say that uh, Iphigenia and Tauris, we don't know exactly the year in which it was written, but obviously it is written uh, in the late part of the fifth uh, century, um, when Athens is already going through, uh, uh, first of all, a military political uh, crisis in the war uh, with Sparta, but at the same time, it is living uh, a very sort of fertile philosophical crisis with the sophists with the thought of the sophists euripides obviously was known as the philosopher of the scene and uh he uh he obviously had the chance to engage uh with uh, the sophists at the time so this text somehow is a text that is deeply problematic it is the critics uh, have uh, talked about a counterfactual text it is a text that springs from uh, Aeschylus Oresteia changing somehow the ending of the Oresteia. We have uh, uh, Orestes that is uh, followed uh, uh, by the Furies. He can't get rid of them, first of all. Um, it is a text in which Euripides plays with the memory of the spectators, somehow quoting other myths, legends, uh, it somehow calls us, spectators, modern spectators and the spectators of the time, uh, to somehow um, question myth itself, uh, to question reality itself, because we are in a land, let's face it, we are in a land of uh, uh, doubles, of, um, it is a deep, deeply onirical play. Uh, from the first monologue, we don't know, Iphigenia, talks about herself both as uh, a person who died in Aulis, uh, killed by her father, but at the same time she talks about herself as a survivor. And uh, this uh, sort of uh, dichotomy will sort of be part of the, of the play uh, throughout the whole play. It is a metamythological play. It is a play that, uh, again, um, quotes uh, other plays, it is a play in which the characters um, at a certain point from victims of the text, from being victims and being uh, characters who don't understand fully where they are and don't understand fully their condition, at a certain point of the text, as if we were making a leap uh, in the history of dramaturgy, going to Pirandello, George Bernard Shaw, the characters suddenly become... Uh, very well aware of what is happening and become almost authors, directors of the play itself, speaking of themselves in third person, for example. Uh, and let me just finish uh, by saying that it's, uh, it's also a very interesting tragedy in terms of uh, the fact that we are talking about a great dynasty, uh, a dynasty in which 
the, the, uh, the protagonists are basically young people and uh, the fathers in the lineage of this great dynasty have all died. So we are under a sky where there are no more fathers on one side. There are only these youngsters full of questions that walk and wonder about this no man's land. And uh, there are no more fathers. And at the same time, the gods, the gods seem, seem to be looking, but they, the gods don't speak. The gods are, the gods are, are not answering. The gods seem almost as if they are playing tricks on our minds and are on the protagonists. I will close my intervention not to, <laughs> uh, not to uh, speak too much, but obviously if there are questions for me, here I am available. Thank you very much, Jacopo, that, that was wonderful. So I think what we can do now is, uh, is uh, uh, move to Giorgio Irano, who is the translator of the Iphigenia, as, uh, as Jacopo Gassman is uh, putting it on the scene. So uh, Giorgio Irano. Thank you, thank you. No, it, it's a great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to, to discuss with you some aspects of this wonderful drama. Uh, and while we are all looking forward to seeing Jacopo Gasma's staging this summer in Syracuse, and uh, Jacopo has already described to you the, the main features of this text. And Iphigenia and Tauris is really a, a very strange and yet a very powerful drama. So at, at the first glance, it is the adventurous story of two siblings, Orestes and Iphigenia, lost in a faraway country, a bit like children in a fairy tale. And Tauris looks like an afterworld, a no man's land, as Jacopo said. Uh, where we are immersed in a in a dreamlike, sometimes nightmarish atmosphere, and many scholars in the past have dismissed Iphigenia and Tauris uh, as a comedy or a romance. And yes, actually, we we have features that belong to comedies or to novels, uh, or at least features that we shall find in later Greek comedy and novel, which seem to have been largely inspired by Euripides himself. For instance, uh, in this drama, like in later comedies or novels, we have people who are thought to be dead, but actually are not. Uh, we have the story of two persons who love each other, in this case, two siblings, but they have been parted for a long time, and then after many adventures, they meet again, but they do not recognize each other at the first glance. They need a sign, they need a token, and some words must be exchanged before they recognize each other. And we also have uh, an exotic setting, we have a temple where some fanatic and barbaric people make human sacrifices. And this will become a stereotype of romance and popular literature, uh, which you can find also in the movies. So mm, many people say, many scholars say, here we have a comedy romance, a story where nobody is killed and everything seems, as Jacobo said, to end happily for everyone, because the goddess Athena appears at the end, and the two siblings can leave Taurus without suffering any harm. Uh, but I do agree with, uh, with Jacopo. If, if, we, if we have a closer look to the drama, is the ending of Iphigenia and Taurus really a happy ending? Uh, first of all, what do the two siblings want? What do they pray for? What do they ask for during the whole drama? And they want to get back to their homeland. And they want to get rid of their legend to be placed into the stream of a, of a normal life. Iphigenia dreams of returning to the palace where she was born and where she lived happily 
as a child, uh, Orestes is expected to become the, the new king of his town of Mycenae. But this is what they will not get. They will not go back home. Uh, the goddess Athena has decided that they shall go to Athens instead. That is to the city, to the very place where the performance itself takes place. Uh, Iphigenia, for instance, uh, she will become for her whole life a priestess of Artemis in a small village close to Athens. And she will be a virgin forever. She'll never get married and she will die in that sanctuary. And this is maybe an important addiction to the traditional myth. Um, previous poets had told us that Iphigenia would have become immortal, a goddess herself. But here Euripides tells us something else. Iphigenia will die and we already see the end of all her fabulous adventures. We see the moment in which the book of her adventures uh, will be closed forever. So is this really a happy ending? Yes, nobody's killed and the, the two siblings, after having recognized each other in a very moving and pathetic scene, prove themselves very bold and clever in inventing tricks and planning their escape from Tauris. And Iphigenia seems to become in some way the author of the drama itself. She has to create a plot and she invents an ingenious plan that should take herself and Orestes out of Tauris. But the plan actually doesn't work because a storm pushes them back to the shore. Uh, they cannot get out of Tauris. They are like trapped in an enchantment. And only the divine intervention of Athena can rescue them from being punished and sentenced to death by the king of Tauris. And they will escape only thanks to the gods. Because the gods, their whole life has been and will be till its end in the hands of the gods though the gods have been absent uh, for the whole drama and only Athena appears uh, in the end. But the gods are those who decided their fate, the fate of the two siblings. And in the, in the end, we have the feeling that men are, uh, are like puppets who are moved by, by superior forces. And this is quite disturbing. So this is without doubt a drama full of adventures and twists and coup de théâtre, but it is more than simply a comedy or a, or a romance. I, I would agree with uh, a great German scholar of the 19th century, whose name was Gottfried Hermann, who almost two centuries ago said this is one of the best tragedies of Euripides. I do agree with him. This is a, a puzzling and strange drama, and yet is one of the most uh, powerful, pathetic, uh, breathtaking tragedies uh, ever written. Uh, I think you will enjoy it this summer in, in Syracuse. I, I'll stop here anyway. I hope I didn't speak too much. No, that was fascinating, particularly because through the first two interventions, we seem to be getting, starting to get a sense of what this is about. Uh, not a comedy, not a romance, but rather uh, a tragedy of frustrated agency, of attempts at agency that seem not to go anywhere, and of displacement that is not resolved, but is, if it is resolved, is resolved through further displacement. and. I don't know, everything here seems to resonate a lot, particularly in these days, but I think uh, uh, before starting to develop further consideration, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Jacopo Gasman to see if he has a reaction to these and if he wants to tell us a bit more about uh, the way he's putting these into the, sea, to the scene and, uh, and we're carrying on with the discussion. So Jacopo, yes.
involved uh, with uh, with Giorgio. We we uh, have been obviously uh, talking quite a lot in the last months about uh, about this tragedy, about his beautiful translation. Um, coming to the let's say the, the sort of uh, uh, my job as a director uh, and to the staging of this play. Of course, I had. Uh, uh, with such a rich and problematic text, I had a lot of uh, a lot of options. For example, at a first reading, yes, you know, like one one uh, notices uh, clearly that uh, um, Paris is uh, um, is is a land that right now is is going through very difficult times. You know, so that that could have been a possible sort of a directorial gaze, but uh, that's not what uh, what what I chose. Um, instead, what, what I thought was very interesting about this play, like, um, was certainly the fact that, for example, obviously I don't want to reveal <clears throat> completely, I mean, what, what we will be doing here uh, in Syracuse, but um, the, a first, uh, uh, element certainly is that um, Iphigenia in Tauris is uh, one of the most, uh, after Euripides wrote this, uh, this play, uh, through the centuries it has been revisited by um, uh, other writers, uh, by um, opera composers, um, the myth of Iphigenia in Tauris, uh, the myth of Orestes in Pilades, his friendship, have been put in paintings, have been put in sculpture. So basically, uh, let me just sort of uh, say that um, uh, one of the elements that will characterize this play is the fact that somehow uh, and it is, as I was saying before, it is a play made uh, made of quotes of quotes. We are almost uh, somehow uh, as if we were in uh, uh, a great archive of stories in a uh, in a Jorge Luis Borges uh, uh, story uh, in a great library of Borges. It could be so. Basically, uh, we will play with the fact that throughout the centuries, this play has been. Uh, revisited and so let's say that uh, also in our play we will have um, a voyage through time the adventure will not only be the the one of the plot of the story but somehow it will be very at first very subtly and then uh, more explicitly it will be uh, a voyage through time through the centuries through art through the different arts I really don't want to reveal too much, um, but yes. Yeah, so I mean, one of the the aspects is certainly this one. Um, we will also play, obviously, very much with uh, with with the ph philosophical uh, contradictions of this play. So uh, on stage, we will uh, we will try to trick. The spectators, or or at least to hopefully, because that's what normally, at least I believe, theater should be doing. You know, it's theater should question, should question ourselves, should question the spectator. So it will need somehow this uh, this uh, this play and the way we will stage it. It will need somehow an active participation from the spectators, trying to put dots together associating uh, um, associating uh, elements or sort of uh, cultural references throughout the centuries um, I don't want to say too much it's it's a, it's a, to talk about the play it's a or how we will say it is a bit more difficult because obviously I don't want to reveal too much um, but yes it will be a voyage through time um, uh, and hopefully, I mean, we will be able to to entertain on one side and on the other side also to make people sort of uh, somehow uh, think a little or question uh, question what they are seeing. 
Thank you very much. Now, now I really want to come to see it. Uh, <laughs> so, so a play, a play of layers and of incrustations of layers, and uh, and about its temporal articulation. That that sounds fascinating. Okay, uh, right. So, before opening it up a bit, uh, I'm gonna go back to Giorgio and 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 ask him a question about how we translated this. How how does it work? What are the problems? What's what's his process? What are the challenges in in doing in preparing a text that has to go then on stage like this? Uh, so to you, Giorgio. Well, of course, it's a great challenge. Um, um, well, translating uh, as as Umberto Eco puts it is uh, um, saying almost the same thing. Dire quasi la stessa cosa was the title of Umberto Eco's book. And the problem is all contained in the range of that almost. Um, roughly speaking, uh, if you listen to translation theorists, there are two, two ways of translating a text. Uh, one is uh, to foreignize a text. And the other is to domesticate it. Uh, to, what do we mean by that? Uh, uh, well, to foreignize in this case, if we talk about Greek dramas, is to Greek eyes, English or Italian. So to reproduce in a modern language the, the, the features of the ancient language. But that's, for instance, what a, a great Victorian poet like Robert Browning did at the end of 19th century with Aeschylus uh, Oresteia, now where he wanted to be absolutely literal and to reproduce Greek, uh, the, the Greek text word by word in English. And because he thought that the reader or the audience must feel that the text comes from another language and from another world. Of course, in this way, you take the risk of being obscure, as actually Browning was. Uh, there was a, an Oxford student at that time who commented on Browning's translation. Uh, at almost every page, I had to turn to the Greek to understand what the English meant. Uh, the other, the other, the alternative is what the what is called to domesticate, and that is to modernize Greek. So one must give to the text the features, the structure, and the rhythm of of a modern language, and bring the text towards the reader or the audience. In some ways, just in some ways, that's what. Pier Paolo Pasolini did with Aeschylus Oresteia in Syracuse in 1960, uh, when he translated uh, temple with church or Zeus simply with God, so that the temple of Zeus became the church of God. Uh, but I wonder, uh, I always wondered if there is a third intermediate way between foreignizing and domesticating. And uh, I think there is, it is the way that the Greek, a, a great poet, uh, T.S. Eliot, pointed out a century ago in a famous essay on translating Greek tragedy. Um, Euripides and Professor Murray, uh, published in 1921. And uh, uh, in this very often quoted sentence, Eliot said, uh, we need an eye which can see the past in its place with its differences from the present and yet so lively that it shall be as present to us as the present. So the translator has to strive uh, towards a translation that may sound at the same time uh, simple but strange, uh, clear but exotic. 
uh, you must try to give the sensation of the radical otherness of the Greek text and yet try to render it alive as it was when it was staged in Athens for the first time. And this is, of course, something which is very easy to say and much more difficult to do, especially if you're not T.S. Eliot. But I think this should be the goal of a translator of Greek tragedy, um, a difficult goal because, well, as Italo Calvino and other great Italian writers said, uh, a translator always works with the untranslatable. So I, I try to do my best with a, with a very difficult text, <laughs> which is uh, Iphigenian Taurus. Thank you very much. Well, we look forward to, to it. <laughs> and so we have been uh, we have been so far remarkably disciplined with our timings, which is very uncommon with uh, with this kind of event. So I'm I'm impressed with everybody. Uh, it was wonderful, and this gives us the advantage of having uh, decent time for further contributions. So uh, I would like to call in uh, uh, Helen Mini. Uh, if she has a question to ask, and I have been told that she might have. Oh, thank you. Hang on. Uh, um, yes, I apologize for my late arrival as well. Um, I had to move into a, a different room and a different computer. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that I missed the very beginning, um, and, but it, I, what I have heard has just been fascinating. And um, I had a question really uh, about the staging. Uh, well, I have a few questions. So um, I, I was wondering, so uh, for uh, Jacobo, um, with staging it in the ancient Greek theater um, in Syracuse, are there um, constraints that that involves because of maybe lack of the, the way you might not use, say, uh, new technology or, you know, video projection or uh, sound design, or, or uh, depending on your how you're going to approach it, and being in that in that performance space, um, are there advantages and are there creative constraints? Uh, that's interesting. Um, actually, um, yes, of course, there are. Um, um, constraints, the first of which um, uh, somehow is also the uh, time at which the play begins, because in Syracuse we begin with uh, uh, the sun uh, that is sort of still setting, so there is this sort of uh, first uh, hour, a sort of, uh, I would call it a blue hour before the sun sets, so the play sort of starts with the sun and then we we go towards darkness uh so obviously there are there is this to consider uh obviously to make my life uh, more difficult uh you quoted actually uh technological means and multimedia the, the this play actually will be very rich of uh <laughs> of all these means which obviously will make it um I hope more interesting, <laughs> uh, but at the same time more difficult, yes, because uh, of course, uh, sort of uh, trying to domesticate uh, uh, lights uh, as the sun sets or videos, for example. Uh, we also have a very, uh, here I don't want to reveal too much, but we have a very particular temple, let's say. Iphigenia's temple here will be, uh, a sort of um, um, multimedia um, um, object, a sort of a magic box out of which I would say somehow that it, this temple will also be somehow Iphigenia's subconscious in a certain way. Uh, we will play with uh, shadows and uh, I don't want to say too much, really. It's very tricky. Um, but yes, so we will use everything that um, 
will make it uh, a hard job, uh, you know, to do a, a play at, at, at that time of uh, of the day. This said, of course, uh, the fascination of just being here, you know, it's four or five days that we are working here on technical aspects, you know, the fascination of, of being in such, you know, uh, in such a historical landmark. Um, obviously, now we are, you know, the actors are not here. I'm just here by myself, you know, simply stepping on that stage in front of, you know, this 6,000 seater amphitheater. Uh, it, it's, it's for me the first time, you know, so obviously um, I will know much more when the spectators will arrive, you know, and when we engage with them. Uh, but clearly, I mean, there is a, there is a, an intensity, an emotion, uh, an emotion that the, 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 the landscape itself gives us, you know, and, uh, and obviously the possibilities and which we will use, you know, the possibilities of also of using what, what goes beyond the amphitheater. There is this, there are these beautiful woods that face the amphitheater here and uh, um, we will also use nature somehow uh, so obviously it's a very for a director it's a very different uh, different approach difficult tricky but very very fascinating and and hopefully we will manage to to make a good job thank you it, it sounds it sounds wonderful it really does um and the other question I had really is, is, is that time old one about the relationship between the actors and the chorus and how, how you are thinking about how approaching that in terms of your staging. Well, obviously the chorus, um, in, in general, in Greek tragedies, um, always, um, in terms of how to stage it, 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 it always brings a lot of questions and somehow mysteries, I would say, because we have uh, some information on other sides. We, we, we don't know exactly how in ancient times the chorus would work. So in, 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 in my case, um, since somehow this play um, will be, as I was saying before, it will be um a voyage through time um what i can say is that somehow this this is also sort of a personal stylistic choice i mean i like uh, i like to work um let's say in a sort of a sober way so the chorus uh, somehow will um will be affected by by the fact that the play itself and the way the way we are thinking about it will travel through time. So just to be clear, um, the chorus itself will have an evolution uh, throughout the centuries. So at the beginning of the play, the chorus will somehow uh, be reciting or chanting uh, in a certain way. And uh, throughout the play, uh, as um, uh, I can tell you at a certain point, uh, uh, there is obviously the very well-known um, Iphigenia in Tauris by Gluck, the opera. We will arrive at a certain moment where opera will somehow invade our stage, but then we will also go further than that. Uh, and uh, we will arrive uh, probably even uh, uh, beyond our our present time. So the game uh, that the game uh, that we will try to play is is to somehow adapt the the the, the story of the chorus uh, as 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 time goes by. Uh, at the same time, what I want to say is that this play is obviously very, um, very centered on on the on on the relationship with between Iphigenia and and the chorus. The the, the chorus has a a very special role within this play. Uh, somehow, I would say, um, it is a very psychoanalytical play in a way because uh, Iphigenia. Iphigenia, if you want, you know, like is a, is a 
uh, is a and rest is himself you know like they are two uh, sort of uh, almost uh, paradigmatic psychoanalytical uh, case studies and i would say that the chorus in a way um represents because the chorus somehow always uh uh enters this play um either sort of uh, through um uh rem reminisce uh, like by reminiscing old times back in greece uh so it works through memory it works through dream it looks as if the chorus is the subconscious of iphigenia sometimes her nostalgia her solitude they sort of give voice to this i hope i've answered i mean it's uh it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question and Hopefully, I mean, the, the play will speak for itself. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that sounds sounds really a uh, rich way of approaching it. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, can I now move on to my, my dear friend, David Amendola, who I'm very happy to, to, to see here. He's one of the rising star of Italian classical studies and, and ancient history. So. I'm be really curious to, to hear what he has to ask and what he wants to say. Davide? Thank you very much, Mirko. You're definitely too kind. Let me also thank uh, the director for Marco Joaquin, the director of the for this very kind. invitation to take part in a wonderful presentation and also my uh, fellow panel. So I have three main uh, questions. So uh, the first two are for um, Director Gasman and the other for Professor Gasman. So um, the first question for um, Director Gasman regards uh, in the production and the staging of, of the play. So I will skip my original question uh, regarding the the temple because uh, you, you said you, you you don't want to reveal too much about the, the scene itself so i'd like to focus on the, the visual um, visual element of um, iphigenia uh Euripides play so the plot of, of Euripides, uh, iphigenia features a very fine set representing uh, evidence of human sacrifice novel props such as uh, iphigenia's letter or um very beautiful or the portable also the portable statue of artemis beautiful choral songs and um, really innovative uh, theatrical um, theatrical scenes like the ritual procession uh, for the purification ceremony at sea. So the visual element is very strong. My my question is: Have you also taken into account ancient iconography? We know that um, Euripides' play was uh, very lacking in this uh, in this respect, and also in ancient visual culture. And so, in particular, vase paintings inspired by Euripides' play, especially the South Italian vases, and the artworks of Roman period, especially in the marble, sarcophagi, and like. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, um, actually, um, somehow in our play, um, inevitably, as I was telling, uh, since it will be a voyage through uh, sort of the um, the cultural, uh, um, the cultural gazes uh, that have uh, sort of um, uh, revisited this play through history. Of course, of course, we will also pass through um, uh, the Roman times. Uh, we will pass uh, through uh, pottery. Um, uh, the vases. Um, I, I, Again, I don't want to say exactly how, how this uh, how this exactly happens, but I, I definitely have uh, have put all, all of these elements um, into 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 our sort of uh, direct the directorial and the uh, set design. Um, um, so yes, I mean history is 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 uh, is very present. History is present uh writing itself is present writing itself in terms of we have to think that uh uh iphigenia in tauris when euripides writes it um obviously iphigenia in tauris uh somehow belongs to the uh, mycenaean age so 
also in terms of uh, uh, what happens in our play, we will also have uh, uh, sort of concrete elements from the Mycenaean age, um, which then arrive to uh, also, I'm talking also about um, uh, writing, about uh, the, the uh, sort of, um, uh, the, 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 um, you know, in Mycenaean age, they, they would write on, uh, on, on rock somehow, no, like on uh, tavolette, tavolette, what's the, I don't know, the tablets, tablets, basically. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but writing is fundamental in this play, you know, like there is, there is clearly a moment in this play, you have quoted, for example, the, 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 the famous scene of the procession. There is a clear moment in this play where Iphigenia, from being uh, uh, just the character in this play, becomes an intellectual, becomes sort of a character that sees herself from the outside and decides that she is, uh, she can decide for her fate somehow uh, and, and somehow becomes the writer, the director herself of, of the play. Uh, so the procession itself somehow is uh, is completely uh decided imminently by the figure of uh, of Iphigenia um in a land in a land basically where this is another but obviously I, I, I go so, I sort of um migrate a little from your question but like uh this play basically is uh, is uh, is uh, all the rituals that happen the procession towards the sea, uh, the first dream that is told by Iphigenia about Orestes, the the ritual that Iphigenia does for Orestes, they are all false rituals, basically. They are all rituals that somehow the ritual of the of the procession is uh, is a stratagem, is completely false. It's an invention. Uh, Orestes' death has not happened. There is a celebration, uh, a celebration uh, of a death that has not happened. Uh, the dreams themselves in this play fail us. The dreams don't allow us to see more clearly through reality. Um, yeah. So sorry, I I I, I went. Uh, I mean, somewhere else. But yes, we will have. Um, uh, definitely the elements that you were talking about within our sort of set set design and directorial approach. Thank you very much. So uh, my, my second question will be uh, concerns the very rich reception history of uh, Euripides uh, play, which has only recently received the attention it really truly deserves. And my question will be, is there something you have borrowed from, or do you have something, or do you owe something in particular to other playwrights who have dealt with Iphigenia throughout the centuries? Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Goethe's Iphigenia of Taris, the four versions, or Gluck, or even Alp or even Altman's uh, Iphigenia in Delphi, or even Mozart and Führung aus dem Serai, which has been connected with. Uh, if he, with Euripides' play and also with Ellen. So to what extent, if any, does your Iphigenia interact with theirs? Oh, it does. Again, um, um, all the authors, almost all of them, all, all of the authors you have quoted somehow um, will, uh, will be part of this uh, great uh, uh, voyage of uh, uh, quotations, uh, quotes of quotes, um, so they, 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 they definitely will be part, uh, but I want to actually maybe, um, talk about just for a second about, uh, like other directors who through time have, uh, approached this text in Italy. It hasn't been uh, done very um, too often. It is not a text that has, uh, has been staged very much. Uh, and, uh, here in Italy, uh, Castri, the great director, um was very fascinated by this play 
And um, so, yes, I definitely have a debt towards Castri because uh, he actually wrote uh, uh, a beautiful diary of notes on, uh, on his uh, Iphigenia in Tauris, which, by the way, through time, through the years, Castri it was a play that he kept on going back to this play. And um, he was very fascinated by... Uh, by these um, these youngsters, these uh, these youngsters lost uh, in this uh, again in this uh, in this territory in this sort of no man's land and uh, talking about the procession and and sort of the um, even the 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 the, 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 the invention of Iphigenia, you know, like he called the, the procession uh, in Italian la baracconata. The great sort of falsification, the great falsification of a ritual, no? Uh, which for me, uh, this this uh, this sort of intuition of Castri has been very important. We are in a land where it is uh, where uh, the false somehow uh, is very present. The false is very present, and the questions about reality, how how how. how how can we know reality? What can we know of reality are always present in this text. Um, l l l let me just say it. I mean, uh, Tauris somehow uh, psychoanalytically could be, if, you know, if we just sort of uh, put the sort of try to, to, to uh, sort of make a 360 degree uh, twist of the temple, you know, Tauris is the other face of uh, Aulis, in a way. Um, these two youngsters could uh, could somehow also be psychoanalytically just playing in the courtyard <laughs> of their of their palace, in a way. If 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 we want to read it through another metaphor, it, it's it, it's a very particular play, you know, like uh, where, for example, it is clear that Euripides. Uh, he doesn't want to tell us the story of uh, um, a good side and an evil side. The, the, the Tauric people here are clearly Hellenized, I would say. There are elements to the, the inhabitants of this land and also to the temple of this land that clearly are Greek. And the Greeks, Iphigenia, Orestes, are by Euripides clearly barbarized, ba barbarized. I don't know if I can use this play, but they are made so, so he plays also with this kind of contradiction. The Greeks are not fully Greek and the Taurians are not fully Tauric, I would say. So again, it is a play that questions that questions um, uh, what we see, what we see, and um, and and that's its extreme fascination. Question is for um, for Professor Irano uh, in regards his translation. So, if I'm not mistaken, um, Euripides Iphigenia was last staged uh, at Greek Theatre of Syracuse in 1982 with uh, Anna Maria Guarnieri famously playing the role of uh, Iphigenia. Uh, on that occasion, the tragedy was translated by the renowned um, scholar of Greek literature, Dario del Corno, and by one of the most innovative Italian writers of the 20th century, namely uh, Vincenzo Consolo. And in what aspects does your, uh, your own translation differ from the one made by del Corno and, and um, the Consolo, and more generally from other uh, Italian translations of the play? Oh yes, it's it's quite difficult for me to to answer this question. I I, I have read other translations of the Phigenian Taurus, uh, which has has had in recent times also a uh, has been more read and studied than in the the previous years, for instance, of the twentieth century. So uh, by the end of 20th century and beginning and the beginning of uh, the 21st century, we had new editions, especially in English, new translations. Um, Iphigenia in Tauris uh, 
has uh, the problem, for me it is a problem, that it, it has been translated by some of the, of the greatest Hellenists and the most renowned and uh, the best translators of Greek drama. There has been a translation by Umberto Albini, who was one of, of the best uh, translators of Greek tragedy in, uh, in Italy. And uh, the translation made by Consolo and Del Corno, and uh, I would be very curious to understand and to, to know how they worked together, because I was at Del Corno was my professor at the University in Milan. I never met Consolo. Uh, I read uh, also his uh, notes, uh, his introduction to the Iphigenian Tauris, and uh, I was happy to, to realize that uh, I, I read it later, after I translated it. I, I didn't want to read many translation during uh, during my job while I was working to my to my own translations. I used mainly uh, commentaries or English translations, so I read them later. Uh, I used some. I received some suggestions and. Uh, in some particular places, so there are maybe some echoes of other translations, but I tried to, to, to do quite a different work. And you must also understand that Consolo and Del Corno translation was wonderful. I, I suppose Del Corno has translated the Greek text and Consolo has given to it that kind of poetical allure, this, uh, because it's, uh, it's very um, adapted to the dreamlike atmosphere of the drama. Uh, at the same time, uh, many years have passed, and uh, after 40 years, and the uh, Albini's translation and Consolo's translation are already 40, and maybe more Albini's one, 40 years old, uh, it, it sounds really like another language. I mean, the, the Italian we were speaking, <laughs> we Italians 40 years ago, even if it was extremely modern at the time, it, it is not modern anymore. Uh, and so you have absolutely to cr create something new. At the same time, I wrote many times on Euripides tragedies. And Euripides is an author who often uses an everyday language. Um, colloquialisms, but not so much in Iphigenia in Taurus. It's much, uh, much more, how do you say, stylized drama. It's uh, much more abstract. It's dreamlike sometimes, even it's, in its language. There are some, some scenes where they use a colloquial language, uh, for instance, when uh, the king of Taurus is, is discussing with Iphigenia, or even when Orestes and Iphigenia themselves have to invent the plot and the, the false ritual that should save them from Taurus, but not so much as in other tragedies. And so it has been a great challenge. I mean, I, I, I have translated even for Syracuse other dramas which are in different ways complex, like uh, the Euripides Heracles, Euripides Bacche. But I think this, this was the, the, the most difficult task I had to face uh, in, in working on a, on a translation of a Greek drama. It's really a, 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 puzzling, a puzzling drama. So I, 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 I don't dare to say how, how much my translation differs from the others, and I had no intention to, to do something uh, different uh, as, a, as a principle. I just uh, follow the text, uh, I would say, w word by word, uh, as uh, Browning uh, said, so translating it and, and to go to enter into the stream of the text and uh, let him go and just try to follow it in the best way I could. 
I must apologize, but I know that uh, Jacopo Gasma has to go. So uh, perhaps if you want to ask him something, do it now or never. <laughs> Yeah, I think we, we have gone a bit over, but not too much for, 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 for the standards, but uh, all the structured questions and so on, we, we are through them. But I wonder if anybody, any of the other participants have any question that they want to ask in the question and answer. And perhaps what we can do is leave just a couple of minutes for people to formulate or, or so on. Um, and otherwise, we can we can close here and we will we would be closing on a high because this was a very interesting series of questions and a very interesting debate. Let's see what's happening. I can't see anything happening in the chat or in the question and answer. I have several questions, but I'm also aware that this would probably end up going on for a while and this is my duty as 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 chair not to let it go on too long and too much beyond the the, the limit professor canevaro let me make you a proposal why don't you arrange a new talk with your <laughs> students uh, at cambridge or at oxford and uh, so that we can connect trento students of giorgio Yerano and other scholars that are uh, linked to INDA, because as you know, we publish a review, an uh, early review, very famous, called the Dioniso, and uh, directed by Giorgio Paduano. Perhaps it would be a good idea, since we have great translator, every year we try to have new, translator, new translations. Uh, this year, Iphigenia, is uh, done by uh, Giorgio Yerano. Eddie Poré is a new, newly recently translated by Francesco Morosi. And then we have the chef d'oeuvre, the masterpiece of Walter Lapini, who translated the whole trilogy, uh, Doristia of Eschilo. Eschilo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be good to be able to carry on with this conversation involving students and uh... And perhaps making sure that some students can actually yes. come to Syracuse and see this. So let's work towards that. Let's yes. let's, let, let's stay in touch and make sure that this is yes. not just a one off, but it's something that will develop into. We would adore it. Count on us. That would be fantastic. Mm. Right. Well, um, I think this has been illuminating and has me has made me want to go to Syracuse as soon as possible and to watch everything and more. Uh, and I hope that's the same for all the participants. Uh, so. I'll, perhaps I'll just uh, give the word one last time to Chiara Avanzato that can say bye on behalf of the Institute. And I want to thank the panelists and the organizers and all the participants uh, for this wonderful event. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks uh, to Marina Valencise, Jacopo Gasman, Giorgio Ierano, Mirko Canevaro, Davide Mendola, and Helen Mini. Thanks so much on behalf of the Italian Cultural Institute in Edinburgh. And so thanks uh, everyone for joining us and go to Syracuse. Definitely I will. So grazie mille. Uh, we look forward to having you. Yeah. <laughs> Vi aspettiamo. Vi aspettiamo. La prima, la prima dell'Ifigenia è il 17, venerdì 17 giugno. E eh, quindi vi aspettiamo. La stagione inizia un mese prima, il 17 maggio con l'Agamennone di Eschilo nella regia di eh, David Livermore, il giorno dopo l'editore di Sofocle, regia di Robert Carson e poi ci saranno tante altre iniziative, prevediamo di dedicare una serata ai rifugiati eh, in Italia profughi dall'Ucraina il 20 giugno e di dedicare anche uno spettacolo, un processo a Edipo che andrà in scena con l'associazione Agon il 24 giugno. Quindi un programma ricco, noi siamo felici di accogliervi, troverete tutte le indicazioni sul nostro sito www.indafondazione.org e grazie a tutti per la bellissima conversazione che avete avuto, grazie al professor Amendola, grazie al professor Canevaro, alla dottoressa Erin Mini e al suo collega Giacchini.
Grazie, grazie a voi. Grazie, grazie. buona serata. Arrivederci, grazie. Arrivederci. 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 Arrivederci.